a lot of times with broccoli, cauliflower, and different types of um, other vegetables like beans and peas, you're waiting a really long time to get to the good part is what people consider it, right? Like the fruiting parts. But a lot of times you can actually use the plants before they get to that stage. And it's like having a little bonus harvest uh, where you can get like two or even three different vegetables out of one plant. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Epic Gardening Podcast. Today we have Linda Lee on the show. And I confess, Linda, when I first started Epic Gardening, and in fact, it wasn't even called that at the time, it was called Exponics, like a little hydroponic blog. Your blog, Garden Betty, was out there. Uh, and it was a big source of blogging inspiration in the early days of, of Epic Gardening. So it's great to have you on the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure being here. So I know that you've got a cookbook coming out, the No Waste Vegetable Cookbook, which I know we're going to talk about. And it kind of brings us to this topic of today's episode. I didn't know that people thought the tops of carrots were poisonous. I just thought people thought they didn't like the taste or something like that. But where did this all start? The fact that people think carrot tops are poisonous, I think it's because we don't really see a lot of recipes for them, especially in this country, in the US. The first time I ever knew about this, I was walking into a Whole Foods, buying a bunch of groceries, you know, they have that you usually see. And the lady at the checkout counter asked me if she, if I wanted her to just break them off and compost them. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? I just, you just weighed them and I just paid for it you know, this entire vegetable. She's like, oh, well, most people don't use them. You know, I don't think you're supposed to eat them. And so we just get rid of them for you. That was sort of my first uh, introduction to realizing how people treat a lot of these um, odds and ends, like the tops and tails of vegetables that we grow at home that we typically eat, but most people do not. Yeah, I think what's interesting to me is I, I was like that. I mean, in the early days, I didn't garden. Oftentimes, I wouldn't even go to the store and get carrots with the top still on. It'd be in the little plastic bag, like a long Imperator style carrot with just no tops on it. So I didn't even consider that you could eat them. But now in the garden, obviously, carrot top pesto, a friend of mine made carrot top pesto and gave that to me. And that was my first introduction to oh, okay, that's a cool way to use them. I didn't think about doing them in that way. And ever since I've try tried to, I can't say I've been perfect, but I've tried to find a way to use them every time I harvest. Well, carrot greens contain uh, toxic alkaloids or you know, we got an allergic reaction to eating them. So it, it must mean that they're poisonous, but there's so many reasons why someone might have an allergic reaction to them. And the fact that you know people point out all of these supposedly dangerous substances in certain vegetables. These substances are found in all vegetables, mm -hmm. you know, so it's one of those things where it's really like the dose makes the poison, so to speak. Yeah, that's what I've always found interesting. You know, early on in the blogging days, I was writing a lot about houseplants as I was getting into them. And there's the whole are these houseplants poisonous angle, right? And a lot of them are supposedly because of the oxalate content within the plant such that if you were to eat, I forgot the poundage, but it's, it's more than anyone would ever eat. You would right. experience some like significant issues from consuming that much oxalates, but you just never will to your point of the dose makes the poison. And I kind of feel like it's a thing to say about these plants. It's like a fact to report on, you know, in, in, it is. in journalism that comes out and it's like, okay, cool. But did you control for the serving size and the dose to your point? And the fact that no one in their right mind could ever possibly eat enough for this to actually impact thus, in effect, it's not really poisonous. Yeah. And I feel with a lot of research studies, what they do is instead of using the actual plant, they will take an extract from that plant and serve it in a dose that's equivalent to eating 50 of those plants in one sitting. So, mm -hmm. of course, if you're extracting it that way, it's, it's not going to be good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just one of those things where... Technically, yes, that might have been like a double-blinded scientific study, but you just would then have to take issue with the methodology of the study and say, okay, this is just completely unrealistic. But anyways, it gets us to the point of, yes, you can eat carrot tops. And not only that, your garden, what other plants are you eating root to tip, I guess, that, that wouldn't be considered normal ones that you should do that with? Um, well, I feel beets and beet greens are fairly popular. I mm -hmm. hope so. Um, radishes are one of my favorites. Like what I like to do in my cooking is I like to put the tops and tails back together again is what I uh, call it. Mm -hmm. So I like to make um, salads with radishes and radish greens, but I also like to cook the radishes and radish greens together and make uh, veggie bowls or rice bowls with them. 
Um, turnips are another uh, vegetable you can do that with. Um, winter radishes is one of my favorites. Actually, when I used to live in LA, I would go to the Korean market and they would sell radish tops separately from the winter radishes that they use for kimchi. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I'm half Filipino, so I grew up with a lot of uh, Filipino food. And then got into other different types of Asian cuisine just from growing up, just the way that I grew up. And what I have always noticed is that, you know, when, when I go to an Asian market or a farmer's market that's predominantly Asian vendors, you just see a completely different set of, well, actually, maybe that's not true. You see a completely different set of plants sometimes, right? There's a lot more mustards, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also you just see parts of plants that uh, perhaps a more Americanized diet would would not consider as food. And then you eat it and you're like, okay, this is, this thing is amazing. I, I, I love it. And so you wonder why it hasn't permeated throughout, you know, different. Yeah. I, I feel like, um, a big part of it is just the way that the American diet, what it revolves around is a lot of meat, you know, yeah. so good meals, barbecues, um, they all revolve around meat dishes and for everywhere else in the world um meat is very expensive and they i guess like i'm vietnamese and chinese so in my family we ate lots of vegetables lots of herbs lots of salads and soups you know things that um are just full of vegetables Mm -hmm. you know and so eating a steak was not really something that i grew up doing um you know and with my parents uh how they grew up in vietnam it's just it's very uncommon to have a meal revolve around a slice of meat. Like they're just very creative with how they use all these different parts of plants. Getting back to carrot tops though, besides <laughs> the pesto, what are, what are some ways that you like to use them? Tops specifically, I think people need to treat them as an accent, sort of like parsley. And I think it's a really great substitute for parsley. So anywhere that you would use that type of herb or you want that earthy kind of flavor. That's exactly where you would use carrot tops. So I like to use it in my soup stocks and just my vegetable soups, just like chopped up, um, taking them off of the thicker stems and then using the tender leaves and sprinkling them over a soup or a salad. Um, I like it as a garnish on like different um, like roasted vegetables or a steak or chicken or pork. I think they are delicious. Uh, you know, like they're one of those things that you can like sneak into like a smoothie um, to balance out like all the other, you know, oxalates that you get from your other leafy plants. Um, I also like one of my favorite things is pizza, like salad on a pizza is how mm-hmm. I like to eat pizza. Um, and I usually use some variation of like microgreens and small little leaves for that. Uh, so a lot of times I will throw on some chopped up carrot tops. Yeah, I'll have to try that out. I, I've only used them as pesto or as sort of additive to like a soup broth type of move. If you grow a lot of brassicas, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, these sorts of things, to be honest, it's something I struggled with for quite some time in the garden until we sort of cracked it in the last couple of seasons here in San Diego. So we've grown a lot of brassicas here now at Epic Gardening. What are some cool ways that that you like to use them besides the obvious, of course? For me with brassicas, I treat them as unconventional salad greens. You know, a lot of times with um, broccoli, cauliflower, and different types of um, other vegetables like beans and peas, you're waiting a really long time to get to the good part is what people consider it, right? Like the fruiting parts. But a lot of times you can actually use the plants before they get to that stage. And it's like having a little bonus harvest uh, where you can get like two or even three different vegetables out of one plant. Um, So with brassicas, I really like to use um, the leaves before you get to like the, all the different buds and flowers uh, that come up. This is, this is where it really benefits people who garden because you can use these giant broccoli leaves or cauliflower leaves Mm -hmm. before the flower buds form. And they are one of my favorites because first of all, they're huge. So I like to use them as like a wrap, kind of like a burrito wrap for, you know, hummus or filling it with sandwich fillings. You know, when you get them when they're young and they're very tender and when you pick them as they're more mature, then they hold their shape really well where you can tote them along just like a sandwich. Um, the same goes for other plants like kohlrabi, um, Brussels sprouts. They actually all start out the same way with these big, beautiful leaves and they're all completely edible. Um, for me, the texture is almost like chard. 
which is how I tend to use them. So if I don't use them raw as a wrap, then I will slice them or chop them into like a braise or a soup or a stew, um, even just like a saute. Once they get past the stage of like harvesting and you think that the plant is done, um, this is particularly, you see this with kale after it's overwintered, but they start sprouting, um, they start bolting and they start sprouting these yellow, sometimes white flower heads. And those little buds on kale, especially, they're delicious and they're completely edible. Um, if your plant has gone through a frost, then the buds are actually very sweet mm -hmm. and they are perfect for salads. I have started doing that over the last couple of years. I haven't, I mean, cooking is a different world for me. I'm not as strong there as I am in gardening. Unfortunately, I'm working on it. Actually, it's been a big focus this year. But I have started mixing those in more as like a salad garnish or a dish garnish, I suppose. So I'm going to try to explore that more. I kind of want to go back, though. You talked about, you know, your broccoli, your your Brussels sprouts, grabbing some of those young, larger leaves. How do you balance how much to take at that point in time versus leaving enough so that the plant actually will, of course, bud? So this is assuming that you have several plants growing, you know, in your raised bed or your garden bed. Um, for me, I start harvesting when they're about a foot tall, generally. Um, sometimes it kind of depends on how many leaves they've sprouted at that time. But I usually will not pick more than three to five leaves per plant. And I will do that weekly. So if you've got a row of, you know, your six to 12 plants, which I think people generally plant, um, you can easily have one meal each week of just those leaves. Yeah. Or you can sacrifice, well, not sacrifice, but you can grow a few plants that are just for the leaves and Different, never, yeah, yeah never yeah, that's, get that's an, It's a funny way to think about it too, is like you can just, it's a garden, right? So you're sort of trying to get a result out of it, at least in the edible garden. So you can just say, I happen to love broccoli greens. I'm just going to grow them for their leaves. There's mm -hmm. no, nothing wrong with that at all. No. And sometimes, I mean, I feel like broccoli heads, a lot of people struggle with getting a good, healthy sized head out of that. And so when you feel as like all is lost and you can't get that perfect form broccoli head or like a large enough head, you should just use the greens and just yeah. grow the plant for the greens. Just convert it over to a, a leafy green. Yep. What's, let's go to kohlrabi. So I think the joke, I don't know if this is something you're familiar with as well, but like when you go to like a CSA box or a farmer's market, they'll just throw a kohlrabi in just because. And people, people oftentimes, you know, go, okay, cool. This made the box heavier, but I don't actually know what I'm supposed to do with the kohlrabi. <laughs> yeah. um, but what do, what do you do? I mean, I even want to go to just the actual kohlrabi itself, the classic part of the, of the plant. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you like to prepare that. <laughs> So yeah, cool. I know I used to get a CSA box. I was like, why did they put this in my box? Yeah, like they just, it just this. it's a filler, you know. It's <laughs> yeah. a filler. Um, so with kohlrabi, the actual you know the bulb part. Um, well, I think people on the show don't know. You know, like all of these brassicas came from one wild ancestor. Um, you know, wild mustard, and from that wild mustard, they bred all these other different plants, vegetables for their desirable traits. And so kohlrabi was bred for the bulb part, you know, which is why it's all swollen. Um, it's also the sweetest part of the plant. Um, it's very crisp. And the way that I use it um, is I like to use it raw, first of all. And so I will peel the outer covering. It's, it's sort of reminiscent of broccoli stem, but better. You know, so I take off um, the outer part, which depending on how old the kohlrabi is, uh, can be a little bit rubbery or too thick to eat. Um, and then I actually treat it like a jicama. You know how you can like slice it, dice it, and you can throw it into any kind of like slaw or salad. And that is, I think, where kohlrabi really shines. Um, I've okay. also made kohlrabi fries, which I really love. Um, and so you can, instead of deep frying them, you can just uh, roast them in the oven make like a nice aioli with it. Um, and it's really good that way as well. So it's got a, uh, yeah. it's not as starchy as a potato. I would say it's more on the um, crunchy side, especially when it's raw. And so you can also, I guess the texture is sort of like a water chestnut. So yeah. it's kind of crunchy, but yet it's tender. Um, you can definitely saute it or stir fry it to give it a softer texture. Um, but it's also really good on the crispy side. Okay, so, I'm gonna have to try that. I, I didn't think about 
the fry angle, but it makes makes well, if I can put aioli on it, it's probably going to be good. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one honest, of the, you know. <laughs> it's one of those things where it just soaks up the flavor of whatever you're cooking it with. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So. Are there any other brassica family crops besides the ones we talked about that you prefer to grow? Because, like you said, I mean, they they really all came from wild mustard. There's so many sort of variants of them that all converge to basically the same plant species wise. So, w- what else do you like to grow in that? family? Um, I am pretty partial to sprouting broccoli. Uh, I'm in a zone five microclimate and I can usually keep that growing year round. Um, So sprouting broccoli, I I guess like for me, I prefer the florets. Like I really like the flower buds on a brassica. Um, I like the texture. I think they're really, you know, if you get like these purple varieties and other colors, I think they're really pretty on a plate. Um, I, I don't know. I like the flavor of them. They all kind of taste more or less the same, but that's just the texture that I uh, like to cook with and eat. So sprouting broccoli is one of my top faves. Um, it's also a very Chinese thing. So there's a lot of like different types of Chinese sprouting broccoli that I like to use mm. uh, where it's less stem and more of like the tender stems and the florets and the flower buds. We so. grew some purple sprouting broccoli this year and it was well, it's hard to say because we had such good success with broccoli and cauliflower the classical mm-hmm. that I, I was a little hyped. I was a little excited about that. I'm curious, what do you like to do besides lettuce? So for me, I think I use more unconventional salad greens at home than I do actual salad greens like lettuce and spinach. And that's just because of what I grow. And I tend to be kind of impatient as a gardener. I like to harvest as soon as I see them tall enough. Um, And so like I mentioned yesterday, uh, there's a lot of plants that you can use before you get to the good stuff, uh, the good stuff, so to speak. You know, so instead of waiting for fava beans, um, you're waiting like two months at least or sometimes three months for the pods to form. In the meantime, you can actually use all of that lovely silky foliage um, and put them in a salad or even cook them. Um, So fava bean leaves are one of my favorites because there's a lot of them, you know. So with other plants, you have to be careful with how many leaves you pick so that you don't affect production of the actual pod or the fruit. Mm -hmm. With on a fava bean fava bean plant, um, they're very productive. Like they grow all uh, leaves, you know, up to like three or four feet tall before the pods start forming. And you can harvest a lot for like a pesto or a salad um, or a stir fry. And they have this really great, mild, beany flavor. You know, like if you're not a person who's into beans, then you would probably like fava bean leaves just because it's a hint of earthy, a hint of bean. But um, I would equate them more to like a spinach, something very mild. That is fascinating. I never considered eating the leaves of fava beans I guess in my head, I just sort of put them in the same category as other beans. And I was like, okay, well, you don't eat the leaves of other beans too much. So why would you in favas? But it's totally right. I mean, what I've used favas for traditionally is actually mostly just as a cover crop sort of resetter plant. Mm -hmm. And I haven't traditionally consumed them too much. Like you said, they're very productive. So even if I wanted to, sometimes it's just a little bit much, um, so what we'll do is we'll chop and drop them and kind of leave them over my, like this year I did it with my tomatoes. So I grew the favas first, chopped them all down, just laid them as, as living green mulch on the tomatoes. And that's sort of the way that they got used. But I never thought about eating them. So I'm going to try doing that when we plant them again this fall. Yeah. I, fava beans are one of those things where it's a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, and not not the actual plant itself, but if you're growing it for the, the actual beans. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes you have to go through a double shucking process, kind of depends on how finicky you are about texture and what you want to get out of it. Uh, But it's it's a process. It's, you know, for me to shuck fava beans, I sit in front of the TV with like a glass of wine and I'll spend (laughs) an afternoon doing it. Hey, you know, not the worst, not the worst way to enjoy a show, I guess. Yeah, not the worst. That's that's a good time for like trashy TV or something, uh, mindless. (laughs) (laughs) But with, you know, the leaves, you can eat them right away. And my trick actually with fava beans, um, 
like if you don't want to go to the double shelling process, you can actually harvest them when they're much younger. You know, I think people usually pick when they're about six inches um, or more, like when they start to see the pods bulge a little bit. Hmm. And that's where you, that's how you see them in the store and at farmer's markets. But if you grow them, you can pick them when they're much younger, um, say a little bit larger than a regular bean. Um, and you can cook them whole and eat them whole. Mm. So I like to throw them on a grill. That's and smart. That saves you that processing time. So he, he, here's a question for you. If you're going with a non sort of classical lettuce based salad, a lot of the time, I mean, this is just my take when you're eating one of those, like, I don't think a lot of us gardeners grow iceberg, but let's say you did, right? Uh, there's not much on the flavor profile of an iceberg. It's mostly there to be dressed and added to. But when you have these alternative or unconventional greens, a lot of them have, you know, more of a beanie flavor, like you, we just talked about, or perhaps there's a little bit more astringency or, or bitterness. Does it change how you then dress and put other ingredients into the salad to kind of balance out those flavor profiles? It definitely does. You know, with iceberg lettuce and the like, um, because they have no flavor, you have to go so strong on like dressings yeah. um, and seasonings for them. But with all of these other leaves, um, like pea shoots are another favorite of mine. They have like a very mild pea flavor. They don't really need much. They don't need more than, say, a little bit of oil and vinegar. Um, and I, you know, for the legume family especially, I just love to um, complement their flavor with citrus. You know, so in uh. my book, I use, um, I have a fava bean leaf and citrus salad uh, where you use... Um, I can't remember what I use now, but I think it's like different types of like oranges or blood orange. And just the juice from the citrus is enough to go with the leaves. You know, you don't need hmm. everything else. Do you sometimes add like any sort of fats or oils to kind of richen up, I guess, like more of a bitter texture or taste? Yeah, yeah you definitely can. Yeah. Um, you know, depending on the leaf, I like oil and vinegar is always my standby. Yeah. And then you'll add some citrus, sometimes a little garlic or salt. Um, so it kind of just depends on my mood. Yeah. And then what, like, what else I'm eating it with. Is there like a go to, let's say, of the standard things a semi experienced gardener might have in their garden? If they wanted to try to craft a, a no lettuce salad, mm -hmm. do you have something? kind of, I guess, basic, but intermediate because there's no lettuce, right? That mm -hmm. you might recommend. Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned pea shoots. Yep. Um, I grow a lot of peas just for the pea shoots um, without ever having peas because they grow so easily. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of times I, I grow peas as a cover crop. I do Austrian winter peas and I let them overwinter in my garden. Um, I sow them very thickly in the fall. And so in the spring, there's just way more foliage than I would ever need for um, a mulch, you know, or for composting. And so I harvest a lot of the tops and we'll just like cut them straight across with a pair of hedge clippers and put those in salads. And that's a really easy way to go. Um, if you are waiting on like lettuces in the spring, then you've got a plant that's already like since late winter, it's already producing. Yeah. Um, I also do a lot of sprouts. So if you're sowing um, cucumbers or sunflowers, if you sow them extra thick and you're thinning them out, you can use all of those sprouts and microgreens in a way and put those in your salad. Um, and this works for actually all kinds of thinning. So if you're doing like carrots and um, all your other different brassicas, all your root crops, uh, you know how we typically try to give like two to three inches of space between each plant and people mm -hmm. will usually thin them and then kind of like toss out the thinning. I would use that in a salad. Yeah, it's so smart. I mean, I know back in my days of growing microgreens, peas, of course, pea shoots were really popular. So so were radish shoots and so were sunflower shoots, which the first time I ever grew sunflower shoots, I love sunflowers just in general. It's native American flower. It's gorgeous. There's so many different varieties. I have all these volunteers in my yard right now that just look incredible. But flavor wise, the young shoots are so good. It's like a vegetal sunflower nuttiness that mm -hmm. would add so much to a salad. I just have never, I just eat them, but I, I, I've never uh, mixed it into a salad. It feels like it'd be a really cool addition. Yeah. I also like how succulent they are. 
Yeah, they're, they're very like, juicy. They're juicy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about like unconventional X, like lettuce or unconventional ways to use brassicas. Now we're getting into seeds. What are your faves? Maybe I guess starting with radish. I realized they were edible by accident many years ago where inevitably you always have radish plants that bolt um, and you never get around to harvesting them. At that point, they're too woody. And so you just let them go for the flowers and for the pollinators and all that. But I realized that when they um, seeded, they looked very different from all these other seed heads in the garden where there are these long, like elongated, pointy end um, pod. And I got very curious about them. And I came to find out that not only were they edible, but they're absolutely delicious because they taste just like a radish. And so if you are growing radishes and you never got around to harvesting the root, um, you can wait for the seed heads to form and use that. And so they have this, depending on the type of radish you grow, they have this um, mildly to very spicy taste. They are crunchy. Um, You can use them as is, like just throwing like the whole seed pod into a salad. There's nothing weird texture wise as far as like it being like fibrous or stringy or anything. It just, it tastes like a crunchy radish just with a different shape. Um, But what I found that I really love is pickling them. And so I will grow radishes like an entire crop just to get the seed pods, just to make pickles with them. And and they actually make a, uh, there's a few seed suppliers that will, actually sell a type of radish called rat's tail radish where it never, you know, it's bred to make abundant seed pods, but the root itself is very minimal. Yeah. That's actually one we carry at botanical. I grew it out last year and that my first experience, it was on purpose because I knew that that was the point of the rat's tail radish was to grow it for that, that seed pod. And yeah, it's, it's wild how close that flavor Matches, I guess, also, I seem to notice earlier on in the seed pods development, you get a different flavor profile. Later on, of course, it gets it gets a little more, at least for me, a little more bitter or tougher. Pungent. Yeah, a little, little <laughs> yeah. aggressive, I suppose. But the, the pickling idea is really cool because radish, pickled radishes is a thing just for, you know, for the root. Do you mix those two together or do you just like to pickle the pods themselves standalone? I typically just pickle the pods because I find them a lot more versatile. Mm. Um, So I, you know, like I obviously throw them into salads, the pickled pods, but I really like them in a cocktail personally. Um, And so a Bloody Mary with pickled radish pods in it is pretty divine. (laughs) You can also throw them into like martinis. Uh, Sometimes I just eat them straight out of the jar. My kids do that. Um, So I they're just really convenient to pack along on a trip or a picnic. Um, So I find them very satisfying. It's just, I guess, because they're so small, they're not as overwhelming as eating an entire pickled radish. radish. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Yeah, you can kind of like pick and choose exactly the amount of flavor you you want (laughs) having a big old slice. That makes sense. Okay, so we're going to get to a plant that I actually love. It's, It's in my garden everywhere, both of my own choosing and sometimes not. And that would, of course, be nasturtium, but I, the confession I have to make and those listening, you guys probably already know, but the flavor I hate, I can't stand it. And, <laughs> and I don't know if it's genetic because it's so repulsive to me that it feels, it feels like something I can't even control. And I'm not a picky eater at all, but I know from a friend of mine and, and now you that you can use and eat the seeds in some clever ways. Yes. So yeah, that's interesting. It's, I find the um, nasturtiums themselves to have kind of a mustardy, peppery flavor. Yeah. So you definitely have to like that bitter mustard. It gets to the point of like <laughs> gas. It, it literally tastes like gasoline to me. Oh, interesting. Uh, and so like mm. I inherently, I just want to kind of spit who wants to drink that, right? So I just like to spit <laughs> it out. Um, but yeah, no, no, a friend of mine, she, she showed me nasturtiums uh, pickled nasturtium seeds as like a caper-esque type of product. I'm curious if that's something that you've messed around with. It is. And that's exactly how I make them. So yeah. um, for me, maybe for everyone else, like it, when I lived in California, nasturtiums were very weedy. And so I let them reseed everywhere in my yard. I would have like a, an entire yard that's full of like all these vines. Um, and at the end of the season, they start um, seeding and they start out of these fresh green seeds before they dry out and drop to the ground. And what you want to use are these green seeds when yeah. they're still like kind of juicy, they're very fresh. Um, you can pick them all. This actually also helps if you're trying to control their spread is by 
picking these seeds before they dry up. Yeah. And so you go through um, like a brining and then a pickling process uh, where you can turn them into a, I wouldn't say it's exactly like capers, but it's a caper-esque flavor. So it does have this type of um, kind of a pungency, mm-hmm. you know, but just like capers, you use them sparingly to accent different dishes. And I use them pretty much anywhere that I would use a caper, yeah. you know, like different roasts, um, you know, on top of pizza or it's uh because the seeds are larger than capers, then I will also chop them up a bit yeah, before yeah, I yeah, use that them. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think what's what's so clever about this to me is, like you said, and specifically in Southern California, nasturtiums are effectively, I don't know if they're native or not. I don't think they are. And I think they're naturalized at this point because they're just <laughs> everywhere. You know, yeah. we'll go a walk in the canyon in the spring and it's just that's the whole that's the whole side of this of the canyon. It's just nasturtiums. Um, so, yeah, in your own home garden. It's, it's really clever to just come in and pick the, the large green immature seeds. And they're actually quite a bit bigger than uh, they, they would end up when they're dried or if you get them out of a seed pack. Mm-hmm. And then the pickling part, it's probably the one way I can tolerate them because I think the pickling dampens out some of that really weird flavor for me and adds in perhaps yeah. a little bit of the acidity, et cetera. Uh, it tends to be pretty nice. But yeah, I would still use, personally, I'd still use them somewhat somewhat sparingly. Yeah, and that's what they're kind of meant for. When you brine them before you pickle them, then the brining process actually mellows out their flavor. Because mm-hmm. if because I've also tried the green seed pods just raw, just to see what it's like, and it's like it's like a nasturtium leaf times five. <laughs> yeah, that would probably be like a killing. I'd have to go to the ER or something. Like, it'd be a killing blow for me. Okay, so we've got radishes, we've got nasturtiums. Are there any other unconventional seeds that that you enjoy? Um, who oh, well, I have tried the seed pods of other different brassicas. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't find them to be as flavorful and so I don't use them, but they yeah. are edible. And so if you're just making a salad of like a mishmash of different garden things, you can also throw those in. Yeah. I've um, tried a mustard like dressing. pods mm-hmm. and that's not bad. Yeah, it's not you bad, know. but it's not, it's nothing to write home about in yeah. my opinion. I would agree. I would agree. <laughs> but now we're kind of getting a little broader and just saying, what are some vegetables that are uncommon in America, but actually quite common and in fact popular elsewhere? So this, like you, I'm Asian. I am Vietnamese and Chinese. And I grew up eating all kinds of weird things, including bitter melon. But you know, like bitter melon is not that weird because they grow it for that squash, you know, yeah. for that melon. Um, you know, what I grew up eating was... Uh, you know, things like um, pepper leaves and squash leaves uh, and, of course, pea shoots, you know, but they are staples in all of these different cuisines that most Americans are not familiar with. And most people don't see them, you know, unless you go to um, a really good farmer's market, usually in like a big city where they might have that if they have like a lot of ethnic farm stands. Um, but you have to be a gardener to be able to get access to a lot of this. And I think that's that's kind of a shame, but that's also one of the benefits of growing your own food is having access to all these nutritious vegetables that you otherwise would never know about. Um, so squash leaves is one thing. In Asia, uh, the squash leaves usually come from um, the opo squash plant. Mm-hmm. And so when they grow that, then they'll also take the vines, like the tender tips, and they will sell that separately as a bundle. And you use it just like any other leafy vegetable, like a chard or, um, you know, like a bok choy basically is how they treat it. Pepper leaves is another thing my dad mm. loves. And it's hard, like when he would come to visit me, I would have to stop him from raiding my pepper plants. <laughs> no way. Because <laughs> I was trying to grow actual peppers. And he's like, but the leaves are so good. Um, <laughs> That one's interesting. So, because it's it's a solanaceous crop, right? And you you often hear like you know tomato leaves, best not to eat them. I don't know where you stand with that, but pepper leaves. How would those be prepared for you guys? So pepper leaves. The first time I heard about it was in Filipino cuisine. Mm-hmm. They use it in a soup called tenola, I believe. Yeah. And so you use that. Uh, you wouldn't use um, the same amount of pepper leaves that you would use, you know, another leafy green in a soup. But you use it as an accent because they taste mildly of like a white pepper Mm. and so it's used to give like additional texture to a soup but also to add that kind of um spicy flavor to it yeah 
I'm gonna have to try that. I don't think I ever, if I had it, I didn't know I was having it, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I'm growing 50 peppers this year, so <laughs> yeah. So you I'll, can you can spare a few leaves here. I think there. I'll be okay. Yeah, I'll take a couple of leaves off. Maybe I'll do pull the brassica move and just grow one for the leaves. See how it goes. Be an yeah. interesting video. Like instead of you have the peppers on the plant, and I say actually I want the leaves. You know, mm-hmm. that'd be kind of fun. Yeah. So they each. Um, I've tried the leaves from hot pe- hot peppers and sweet peppers. Um, they're fairly similar. You know, hot peppers actually they're obviously going to be a little bit more spicy. Yeah. Um, but they're both really good. Like you can toss them into like a stir fry, you know, mm. saute just like a little bit, you know, really treat it like as an accent and not yeah. as a as a green. One that's near and dear to me is a, a few years back, I created this loofah challenge and growing, you know, growing a loofah. It was on Instagram. I was like, I'm going to try to grow this, you know, for the shower sponge idea. Uh, but of course, when they're young, you can also just eat them. Uh, and mm-hmm. I don't know if you've messed around with them at all. Uh, no, I can't grow that up here. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> no, without a greenhouse. I, I was like, maybe, maybe in your uh, in your LA home, you experimented a little bit, but I could barely grow it here. I get like, uh, actually, you know, last year was my best year. Some crops. This is taking us a little bit far afield here, but some crops, I feel like I have, I have to put in my dues. Like no matter what, I just can't get it in the first year. Maybe I'm just too dumb to know how to grow it right or something. But you know, some things I, I nail, like potatoes. I've never had a problem in my life. Uh, Lufa first year dead, second year one, third year, uh, like 15, you know, and now I'm like, okay, I think I get it. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you've had sort of like white whale crops like that. No, totally. And especially here, because I'm dealing with such a different climate and I grow a completely different set of plants that Mm -hmm. I do in central Oregon than I did down in SoCal. Yeah. You know, and then the first few years was definitely experimentation and lots of things died because I didn't realize that we have less than 30 days of frost free growing here. Wow. But now really? I make it work. Yeah. Without a greenhouse, but that's coming as yeah. well. Cool. Cool. <laughs> that will make yeah. things a lot easier. That will help you out quite a bit. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, how did that change go? Like how was the first season in Oregon versus San Diego? Cause, or sorry, Southern California. Cause it's a big, that was a huge change. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and, in Cali, you can just grow anything year round. Like there is really no true season. And what's interesting though, is that in California, I would have trouble growing um, kale and spinach, you know, from like late Same. spring through summer, just because it's so warm. Yeah. And here kale will grow all through summer. Like it's like, they think it's fall here, you know? Yeah. So it's just yeah. a very different climate. Um, you know, learning about the first freeze, uh, that was something. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, and we also get freezes like into 4th of July sometimes. Really? Damn, that's crazy. And so my garden and probably most gardens in Central Oregon, if they want to be successful, it stays covered year round. So usually um, in the cooler season, then I have frost cloth always ready, just like um, clipped up to my mini hoop houses. Yeah, yeah. Ready to cover anytime. And then in the summer, I usually have shade cloth over it, not just for providing shade, but also for hail. Yeah, that is quite a different, uh, (laughs) quite a different setup there. Okay, so going back to these unconventionals, uh, is there anything that that growing up in Oregon has unlocked from an unconventional veg perspective that you couldn't have done in in in, uh, Southern California? Oh, let's see. Um, Well, I guess here in Oregon, I really focus on things that are short season. So like anything, if I can grow a cucumber in 40 days or 50 days, like I'm all over it. And Mm. that's how I'm able to grow things like cucumbers um, and tomatoes and squash. I find these very short season varieties. Um, You know, with tomatoes, you mentioned this earlier, you know, it's it's hard to get them to ripen unless you time it perfectly here in Oregon. You get the right like 60 to 70 day variety. Most of the time people are struggling and they are harvesting lots of green tomatoes at the end of the season, trying to save their plant. Mm -hmm. What I found to try to maximize uh, the plants, the tomatoes that I do grow is I do use some of the leaves in my cooking. Okay. Um, And so I, again, like just like pepper leaves, I use it as an accent. So I will mix them into a tomato sauce. So I make lots of tomato sauce and I also Mm -hmm. make like a, a salsa verde green tomato salsa verde. Um, but if you're cooking 
uh, down a homemade tomato sauce. If you add a few sprigs of tomato leaves to that sauce, it adds a really nice depth of flavor that you couldn't get from just tomatoes themselves, especially if the tomatoes aren't fully ripe yet. Mm -hmm. um, but the leaves, you know, like when you smell them, it has that kind of earthy, herbal. It's just it's like a great, deep, great sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you don't get that in the actual fruit, you know, but you can add it to a sauce and get that same depth of flavor just by using a few tomato leaves. Okay, I need to try this out because you've now blown my mind that I, I just really thought you couldn't slash shouldn't eat pepper or or tomato leaves or I guess if you extend this, you might be able to throw an eggplant leaf into something. I don't know if you've Probably. ever tried that. I haven't just because I I don't know if there's even a flavor associated with eggplant yeah, leaf. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, cool, but should you? you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. Well, yeah. Linda, it's been great having you on the show. Some really inspiring, thoughtful ideas for just rethinking what you're actually growing. You know, there's so much more that you can use of common plants and then also some uncommon, so-called uncommon plants that, that you can actually just grow and, and use in the garden. So I know people can find you at Garden Betty, but where else can they connect with what you're up to? Um, they can connect with me on social media. I will be honest in that I try to stay offline as much as I can, but mm -hmm. I do check my messages and see emails, especially that come in. Um, I interact a lot. So first of all, you can find me as Garden Betty on Facebook, Instagram, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to my website, gardenbetty.com, you can also join my email list. And that's where I share weekly what's going on, not just with the blog, but also um, things that I am playing around with in the garden, uh, tips and tricks and, you know, all of that. So awesome. I I love my email community. That is the best way to get a hold of me because I do read every email. Um, and yeah, you can check out my book, The No Waste Vegetable Cookbook, all of the plants that we've talked about the past few days. I have uh, recipes for all of them um, and ideas for making up your own recipes with them as well. Awesome. Yeah, I, I will be grabbing a copy. You guys can do so in the podcast description. Thanks so much for coming on, Linda. It's been great. Yeah, thank you so much.